Hello. Hello. Got a joiner. All right, Karen. How are you doing? <laughs> good. How are you? Good. I wasn't sure if I'd have anybody or not. I sent out an email maybe about a half an hour ago. Oh, did you? Yeah. So I just thought I'd check and see. And uh, so I wasn't I wasn't even expecting anybody or not. I just didn't know because people are writing midterms and I didn't, you know, it's kind of like the, the first week after. Did you write your midterm for 110 yet? Um, I have printed it off and I have worked on it most of the day yesterday. I ah. just have to scan it and send it in. Okay. It yeah, that'll be my job. <laughs> very hard. <laughs> There's a lot of information in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll be right back. I'm going to get a drink. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> what we're going to cover today is Unit 4, and it's going to be in psychoacoustics. And it's our first topic in psychoacoustics. Before the midterm, we had three topics in mainly the physics of sound. So you had frequency, wavelength, speed of sound, and then you had the decibel from hell, and then you had complex sounds. Spent a couple of weeks on each of those units. And now what we're looking at is the perception of sound. And unit four really deals a lot with thresholds, that word threshold. When you think of that word threshold, that's what's done when we're testing hearing. And a lot of what testing hearing relies on psychoacoustics, the rules for, for, for how we hear sound and how we choose to respond to sound. So let's take a look, I'll share screen, and let's see what we've got here. Share screen, and let's go and look at our notes first. And there you have our notes threshold concepts, threshold methods, threshold types, DB references, and then last of all, binaural hearing. In other words, hearing with two ears. What is hearing with two ears? How does that differ from hearing with one ear? So at the very beginning, let's get paragraph number one out so that we don't have to deal with it anymore. Let's just get rid of this guy and get uh, and, and move on. The first thing we look at is differential threshold. Now that is something more done in research. You and I, we don't do that as hearing instrument specialists, okay? Differential threshold means you already hear the tone. You hear something, beep, and differential means what's the smallest change or difference that I needed to make in order for you to notice that there was a difference. So let's say if you heard a thousand hertz tone at 40 dB. Beep. If I turned it to 41, would you hear a difference? Or would I have to turn it up to about 45 for you to hear that there was a difference in intensity? Or let's play it at 40 or 50, and let's keep the tone at 1,000 hertz. And now let me make it 1,001 hertz. Did you, were you able to hear that there was a change? Were you, what's the smallest difference required for you to notice a difference. And that's why just differential threshold is sometimes called just noticeable difference, JND. Sometimes it's called difference Lyman, L-I-M-E-N, same thing. Sometimes it's called delta, as in the Greek triangle, delta. And delta just means change. So what's the smallest change in frequency I needed to make for you to notice a change? Or what's the smallest change in intensity I needed to make for you to notice a change? Okay? Or delta D, duration. If I played a tone for one second, beep. Or I played the tone for 1.1 second, beep. Were you able to notice a difference? So sound takes place over three dimensions, frequency, intensity, time. So what's the smallest change I needed to make in frequency or intensity or in time for you to notice a change? And the picture in PowerPoint that deals with it, have a look at this guy, and then we'll dispense and get out of here, okay? Differential threshold for frequency. We'll look at delta F, for example, and look at the vertical axis, delta F. And you've got a whole bunch of lines here, but let's just look at the top square one here. So if they played a sound really soft at 5 dB, they're playing at 5 dB, 
really soft. What's the smallest change I needed to make in frequency for you to notice a change? Well, gosh darn, let's look at a thousand hertz. Look at my cursor. It needed to be made about, mm, about 15. You needed to change a thousand hertz. You needed to make it about 1,015 1, hertz to notice a difference. Hmm. What if the tone was a really high pitch? See this where it goes way up here? Let's go down, 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 down. So what if I played you like a four or 5,000 hertz tone? Some really high pitch tone, really soft at five dB. How much change would I need to make for that really high pitched tone for you to notice the difference? Look at this. I'd need to make about 120 hertz difference <laughs> for you to notice that there was a change. If I played the tones really loud, look at, look at the black square, it's 80. If I played the tones 80 dB, I don't need to make as much of a change, especially at the bottom. Look at these ones here. They're all lying on the bottom. So it means for these, these lower frequencies, I hardly needed to make any change in frequency for the listener to notice that there was a difference. Anyway, we'll go back to our notes now because that's differential threshold and we are testing that. Good, so let's dispense with that. We'll put that in the rear view mirror now. And now let's look at what's in the middle of the page here, absolute threshold. Now, absolute threshold is indeed what we test when we test hearing. We're saying, did you hear it or did you not? When you hot, you hot, when you not, you not. Did you hear a thousand hertz or did you not hear a thousand hertz? So it's not the change or difference, uh -uh, it's just presence versus absence. Did you hear it or not? So read with me, absolute threshold, the main type of threshold we use. What's the smallest value that you can hear? Presence versus absence. When we say threshold, we mean absolute threshold for intensity. So on the audiogram, when you put headphones on someone and the person's raising a finger or pushing a button to let you know he or she heard, that's called absolute threshold testing. So it's the softest level required for a person to report that he or she heard a sound. This is what we do in routine audiometry down the page because things now get clever. This is starting to get, this is where people have bias. Think about it. You got a guy named Herb. He's a farmer. He doesn't want to come to the hearing test. His wife is dragging him in. She's complaining that he's not hearing. He doesn't even want to be there. Does he have a bias? Is he loaded with impressions and feelings? Yep, you bet he is. And when he's listening to the tone, does he want to make a mistake? Nope. And he's mad. And he's going to hear, let's say he can't hear till 50 decibels. So you play him 40, he doesn't hear it. You play him 60, he might raise his hand, but even that kind of sounds soft. You, you might have to make it 65 and he's going to go, and then you make it 55 and he's kind of, I don't know, make it 60. You know, he's, so his thresholds may look worse than they are because he's he got a bias in them. He wants to be sure he hears it before he raises a hand. Now look at your first grade teacher, Mrs. McGillicuddy, with her little white purse. And she sits there in a little in her little skirt and blouse and she's 70 years old and she's told she's got a hearing problem and oh she used to give tests all the time in school I mean she loves kids and she likes all that stuff so she's eager beaver she wants to take the test so she's sitting there and she's going and you haven't even pushed the button her bias is the opposite of herbs she she has a bias and you as a clinician her thresholds are going to look better than they really are because she's guessing. And you have to tell her, hey, raise your hand when you're a little bit more sure, okay? <laughs> and Herb, you got to say, hey, Herb, you got to guess a little more. Raise your hand when you're, not just when you're absolutely certain, but listen to the softest thing you can hear. And even if you're not sure, let me know. You see how one's on the right and one's on the left, and your job as a clinician is to pull the person to the middle. 
because people come to a test with biases. There's all kinds of bias, and now let me call bias another word, noise. You're not trying to listen to a signal buried in noise. And noise can be the background noise in the room, but you know what? Noise can also be the crap that you're bringing in. Not you, the audiologist or the clinician, but the, cl the client. Maybe the noise is a language barrier. Maybe the person's from China and, and the son or daughter has to constantly translate. That's going to be a problem too, because you have to convey, tell your mom to raise her hand when she hears a tone. <laughs> Don't raise your hand only when you're just when you're positive, but listen for the softest that you can possibly hear, because we want to find out the, your, the, the softest thing you can hear. Blah, 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 blah. That all gets lost in translation. Things when you tell a story to someone around a table, by the time it comes back to you, the story's different. Okay? Things get lost in translation. That's also noise in quotes. So when you think of noise, noise is the Scottish word, crap, C-R-A-P, the junk that gets in the way of, a, of the pure threshold for the signal. And the signal is the, what you want to hear. The signal is the tone. So now if we go back to our notes, let's see what we wrote about that. Because that's what, it's a rather big topic and it means a lot in clinical testing. Listen to this. Or read this. The client is always listening to a signal buried in some noise. Whatever it takes to just barely hear a signal is called your threshold. Whatever interferes is called noise. One's threshold is thus sort of a gray area. There's no such thing as a perfect, unadulterated, pure threshold. For any set threshold, the amount of sensation in your system you'd think would be completely unchanged. But this isn't the case because we always have some noise in our system. The instructions, the attentiveness. I mean, think about it. Okay, Think of the difference. Here's clinician bias now. Okay, not even client. Raise your hand when you hear the tone, okay? Now, if you gave those instructions as opposed to, I want you to, you're going to hear some tones under these headphones, and raise your hand every time you hear them. Even if the sounds get very soft or faint, still raise your hand, okay? Because we'd want to find the softest thing you can hear. Now, which set of instructions do you think is going to get the most accurate response? The better set of instructions. So instructions also is noise. So noise is, can come from the clinician. Noise can come from the client. Noise can be background noise in a room. It can be, it's anything that interferes. <clears throat> this is a topic, especially people who've tested hearing. And Karen, you test hearing, don't you? I can see you sitting there in a booth. So I'm sure you know quite a bit what I'm talking about here. You've got clinical experience. And this is exactly our new students who don't have clinical experience. This is the stuff that's quite new for you. And that's why we cover it in acoustics, because it makes a big difference in the hearing thresholds you're going to get. So let's look and examine some of our notes now again and read about that. Imagine an experiment where a subject listens to a tone at some dB level. The tone is presented a hundred times. 50% of the time the tone is absent, and 50% of the time the tone is present. True positives means the tone is presented and the client said yes. A true negative would be when the tone is absent and the client says no, I didn't hear anything. False positive, the tone is absent and the person is guessing, like Mrs. McGillicuddy with her little purse, the first grade school teacher. False negatives would be like her. The tone is present, but he says he doesn't hear it. So let's look at what can happen here. We'll go to our next slide. Here you go. <coughs> Excuse me. A tone at 50 dB. Now don't worry about this HL for yet. People like Karen who've been testing hearing know what HL is. That's dB hearing level on an audiogram. We'll get to that in a couple of weeks. Just think about tone at 50 dB SPL, whatever. This 50 dB is clearly audible, okay? The subject has normal hearing. So if the tone is present, 
or the tone is absent. You can see the top of the box there. Okay, if the client, but the client also has a part, he, he or she can say yes or no. So pretend you've got this 50 dB tone and it's presented over 100 trials. In 50% of the trials, the tone is present, and in 50% of the trials, the tone is absent. Well, if you've got normal hearing, you can hear all the way down to zero. Every time the tone is present at 50 dB, you're going to say, yup. And every time the tone is absent, you're going to say, nope, I don't hear it. So look where your answers are going to fall. They're all going to fall in the true positive and true negative boxes. You won't have any mistakes because the tone is clearly audible to you. It's presented at 50 and you can hear all the way down to zero. So 50 is decent, easy peasy, Japanesey. Now let's go to the next slide. What happens if the tone is five? No longer 50, now the tone is five. Guess what? Your whole face is going to change. You're going to be going. You're going to squint with Clint. Your, your whole confidence that someone's ripped the rug right out from under your feet. Because now the task is hard. Because you can hear down to zero, but the tones, whenever they're presented, are only at five. And five ain't much more than zero. That's what your clients are doing. They're listening to the softest that they can hear. And that can get hard. That's a harder task, okay? It ain't easy. So A, you have to be sensitive to your client getting fatigued at this. Okay, and that's where instructions come here, come into play big time. If we go back to our PowerPoint, we can now look at a couple of slides that preceded this one. Because now if the tone is five, you're, yep, sometimes when the tone was present, you're going to say yes. And sometimes when the tone is absent, you said no. So you had true positives and true negatives. But guess what? You're going to make mistakes. Sometimes when the tone was absent, you're going to guess. And sometimes when the tone was present, you're going to say you didn't hear it. So your, your marks are going to be more all over the board and not necessarily like they were over here. Okay? This is what you want, but the Rolling Stones have even saying you can't always get what you want because you're going to get lots of this crap. So... Sew buttons and become a tailor. What did we do about that? Well, here's a slide for you. Because in the 1950s and 60s, the rules weren't set. Okay, the way we test hearing wasn't set. Some people descended. They started at a loud level, presented the tone at, say, 70, the guy heard it. Down to 60, the guy heard it, or down to 55, he heard it, down to 50, he heard it, down to 45, down to 40, and then they would mark down the lowest level the guy heard it, and they would call that threshold. Other people would start at zero. They'd go zero, the guy didn't hear it, five, he didn't hear it, 10, he didn't hear it, 15, and they'd mark down the level where the guy heard it. Now, I'm, the, here's the question, look at the middle. You will get better thresholds than if you ascend. If you descend, you will get better thresholds than if you ascend. And the reason why is because when you descend, you know what you're listening for. You've already heard the tone. Now it's just getting softer. But you know what you're listening for. So if your method of testing involved descending only, that's going to give you better hearing thresholds at softer decibel levels than if you ascended from nothing and went up. Because when you're ascending, you don't know what you're listening for. Okay. This is where two guys who lived in a van down by the river in Wisconsin at a state fair, believe it or not, came up with the way we test hearing now. We use an ascending, descending procedure. We combine 
both of these. What we do is we test at some level, the guy hears it, and if he hears it, say at 60 dB, you go down by 10 to 50. If he hears it, you go down by 10 to 40. If he doesn't hear it, you go up by 5 to 45, say. If he hears it, good, mark it down. Now you're going to descend again, now from by 10 to 35. He doesn't hear it, go up to 40. He doesn't hear it, go up to 45, Bink, he hears it. Two ascending responses at the same dB level is threshold. Now, Karen's probably done this a thousand times, but again, people who haven't done this, this is the way audiometry is done, okay? And no regrets. I mean, you got to learn what the decibel is, what the hell a decibel is, and you got to know what hertz is. So that's why the first half of this course was all teaching about what sound is. Now we're looking at how sound is perceived, psychoacoustics, and it deals with hearing testing. So very carefully, we'll walk through this little minefield and make sure we don't get hurt. So again, the Houston Westlake ascending descending procedure. It combines both going down and going up and read the rules. Descend in 10 dB steps until the person no longer hears it. Then go up in 5 dB steps until he does hear it. The tone heard at two ascending steps at the same level is threshold. Now you move on to the next frequency. And we generally start out with a thousand hertz. And then we go to 2, and then 4, and then 8, and then down to 250, sometimes 125, and then 500. And then you retest at 1,000 to make sure you got the same thing as you did the first time. Now you're done that ear, move to the other ear. <laughs> okay, hearing testing can take at least a half an hour to 40 minutes. It can, if to do a good test, it can take a bit of time. But that's what you're being trained for. So... Houston-Westlake approach helps to get around bias. It helps, but it ain't perfect. The clinician's skill is still important here. Noise that interferes with an accurate detection of the signal being the tone can be language barrier, instructions, background noise. Then again, there's client bias. The differences between what you can hear and what you say you hear. I'm put a star by that. What is the client bias? The difference between what the client can hear versus what the client says he or she hears. And think of Herb versus Mrs. McGillicuddy. That's why I put those two names on the bottom of the slide. Okay, this has been our first approach looking at psychoacoustics. Let's read what we've got here. Down to the bottom of the page at very soft listening levels, that's where the devil sneaks under the door. Okay? Like smoke under the door. At so Read this right here. At soft listening levels, that's where bias comes into play. Bias doesn't come much into play here because the task is easy. You either hear or you don't. The tone is 50 dB. You, you can hear down to zero. So bias isn't going to play much of a part there. This is where bias is going to play a part, when the tone is 5 dB as opposed to 50. Good. Subject bias. There it is. I wrote it again in the notes. Bias, the difference between what someone can answer versus someone what someone does. Subject bias. Herb. There he is. There's a description of him. He responds only when he hears, when he's sure. He just, no one's fool, doesn't want to make mistakes on the test. Mrs. McGillicuddy, the retired first grade teacher, wants to please. She knows what tests are. She also doesn't want to make mistakes. So she responds constantly, even when the tone is not, not presented. She's got lots of false positives. So, on a quiz or a test that would come up in psychoacoustics, if I ask a question like, Herb the farmer, 
Is he going to have a lot of false negatives or false positives? You're going to say lots of false negatives. He wants to be sure he hears the tone before he raises his hand. So if his threshold is really 50, you might end up with thresholds like 55 or 60. They are worse than what he really had, what he really can hear. Mrs. McGillicuddy, her bias goes the opposite way since she's guessing lots of the time. Her thresholds and you as a clinician, if you don't pick it out, you might end up with thresholds of say 40 instead of her true thresholds of 50. Okay, her thresholds may end up looking better than they really are. The art, A-R-T, not the science, the art of this field is learning how, as a clinician, to pull in Herb from right of center and pull in Mrs. McGillicuddy from left of center. There we go. Good stuff. And our notes move on. Fantastic. Let's go. So let's move on down the page, if I can, anyway. Darn Kurt, here we go. Examiner bias. This is you, the clinician. Your experience, your knowledge of equipment. Are you presenting the tone long enough? Are you going, dip? Or are you going, dip? Okay. Instructions are your bias. Raise hand when you hear a tone versus raise a hand even if the tone is very faint. Language barrier. Oh, yeah, ascending, descending. Oh, that's all settled. We do that now. Okay, criteria for threshold. Here's another one. Language barrier. Here's another one now. Environment. This is actual external or internal noise. Okay, and the equipment. Do you have a sound-treated room? Is your audiometer properly calibrated? So these are all, I've listed them, one through five. Things called crap, C-R-A-P, junk, in other words, noise in quotes. Doesn't just have to be a competing sound. It can be anything that interferes with a proper uh, estimation of threshold. Good. Let's move on down to clinical audiometry here. Top third of the page. Method of limits to get around bias in finding absolute threshold. Notice the three italicized words, okay? Method of limits. And why do I use that word? Well, there's different ways you can test hearing. You can use what they call method of adjustment. Method of adjustment means the client, him or herself, is testing his or her hearing, okay? In other words, I've got headphones on, and I'm raising up the tone until I hear it, and then raise, doing it down until I don't hear it, and I'm just kind of pushing a button that way. I'm adjusting the tone, and I'm listening to the test. Sometimes industrial hearing tests are done this way. The guy's wearing headphones, and the tone is coming out like, doo -doo 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 -doo. it's getting louder. As soon as he hears it, push the button. And then the tone gets softer, softer, softer. And when you no longer hear it, let go of the button. Okay, now the tone's going to get louder and louder. As soon as you hear it, push the button. As soon as you hear it, let go so you don't hear it. There. Okay, now you're pushing the button when you, when you don't hear it so that you can hear it. And once you do hear it, you let go of the button until you don't hear it. Then you get a bunch of zigzags. And then they take the average of the zigzags. And that's your hearing threshold. You don't do that. We do method of limits. Method of limits has two things to it. Now look at your notes and circle them. I promise I'm going to ask this on a quiz or a midterm or a final, okay? Method of limits, two things. You, the clinician, are adjusting the tone. The client is listening. And the second thing is you're adjusting the tone in fixed increments. And in our field, it's 5 or 10 dB. You're, we don't usually test in 1 dB increments. And Karen will be the first to tell you that she's not testing 43 dB. Okay, she's either testing 40 or 45. We never test 41. Okay, we test in 5 dB steps. That's what I mean by the increments. So two things regarding method of limits. The clinician adjusts the stimuli. And secondly, the clinician does so in fixed increments, method of limits. So when you look at method of limits, 
Okay, why are you using method of limits? To find the absolute threshold. And why are you using it again? To get around the client's bias. It works pretty good. And what's our, how do we use the method of limits? Look where, it's where I'm highlighting right here. Method of limits can be applied in various ways, descending, ascending, or number three, ascending, descending approach. That's what we do. So the ascending approach is what I showed you on this slide up here on the right. Descending would be on the left. So you can apply the method of limits, the clients adjusting the tone in fixed dB increments. You can do that in a descending approach, or you can do that in an ascending approach, or you can do that in a combination that uses both of those, and that's what we do. So how do we use method of limits? By means of the Houston Westlake ascending descending procedure. Those were two investigators that came up with a really good compromise, and it's the way that we still do testing today. Houston Westlake. And what is it? A way of applying what? The method of limits. And what, what is the method of limits? The client adjust or the clinician adjusts the tone, and he or she does so in fixed increments. And we are doing this because it works to get around client bias. There's the general story. This is the beginning of psychoacoustics. We're doing very well. We've got a half an hour into our Zoom session. This is great. We're covering it just fine. So here we are. All kind of, here's, we're talking about biases. Clinicians have to become, requires experience in recognizing these biases because even when you're using the method of limits, yep, the advantage is it's fast. Disadvantage, bias can still influence threshold. And that's why I say in, in, in italics, the clinician requires experience in recognizing these and you will get your experiences doing it. The ascending, descending approach is, is, is uh, described right here. Now we can think of an example. Let's look where I've highlighted this on page two, okay? Look where this is highlighted, and I'm gonna give an example now. Let's just talk, I'll stop sharing, because what I'm gonna do is really talk like this. Start at some DB level that's audible to a client. So now Karen will probably fall asleep and I won't blame her because she's done this a thousand times, but for people who haven't, have a listen. You present the tone at 60, the guy hears it. What do you do? Go down by 10 to 50. The guy hears it, what do you do? Go down by 10 to 40. The guy doesn't hear it. What do you do? Go up by 5 dB to 45. He hears it. Go down to 35, because every time he hears it, you go down by 10. Go down to 35 now. You got him once at 45, ascending. You need twice. Down to 35, he doesn't hear it. You go up to 40, he does hear it. Oops, now you got one ascending at 40 and one ascending at 45. What do you do? Well, from 40 down to 30, doesn't hear it. Up to 35, doesn't hear it. Up to 40, he doesn't hear it. Up to 45, he hears it. Done. You've got two ascending responses at 45. Then again, you might have had him once at 45, you went down to 35, he doesn't hear it. You went up to 40, he does. Now you got one at 40, one at 45. Down to 30, he doesn't hear it. Up to 35, he doesn't hear it. Up to 40, he hears it. Oh, now you got two ascending responses at 40. Now 40 is your threshold. This is why we use the ascending, descending approach. You need two ascending steps where the guy hears it at the same dB level. That's the Houston Westlake ascending, descending procedure. Okay, now we can wend our way into a different path, a different patch. Let's go over to here. Intensity affects threshold, but so does frequency. Ooh, look at this guy here. Now, this is a trip. So let's look very carefully at minimal audible field and minimal audible pressure once called MAF, M-A-F, 
and the other one's called MAP. In our PowerPoint slides, let's see where we get to that in, in our pictures here. Oh, this one here, this black and white one, this is just giving you an outline of the ascending, descending procedure as an example. What you can do with what happens on the left, or you can do what happens on the right, but that's, we talked about that already. So you can look at that on your own, but basically we've described it. Let's look at, yeah, these are getting pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Here, this is just saying type one error. Lots of false positives, telling the guy he's pregnant. <laughs> a type two error, it's called a false negative, telling a pregnant woman you're not pregnant. Okay, that's just meant to be humorous. And these things here, I'm not going to worry about. Just, just leave them alone. Okay. So now we start looking at all of these weird curves. Look at these curves. And look at these, this curve here. Look at this one first, and I'm going to circle here. Look at the bottom. The circles show the amplitude of vibration at the eardrum, at threshold, as determined by some guy named Wilska. And the curve represents the calculated amplitude of the air molecules in a sound wave at threshold. <coughs> where the ear is most sensitive to the amplitude of vibration, and look where I'm circling, right here. The eardrum vibration is less than the width of a hydrogen atom. So look at this amount of movement of the eardrum at threshold, between around two to 5,000 hertz. If I presented those sounds, to a, to a soft level that a normal hearing human being could barely, just barely heard them. And I measured the movement of the eardrum, of the pressure against the eardrum. The eardrum would be moving less than the width of a hydrogen atom. Okay? Notice, however, that there's a curve. In other words, when I go to some frequencies, look at 100 hertz. You need way more pressure against the eardrum to hear that one. And if I go to 50 hertz, you need more yet. The sweet spot seems to be right here. And my fine feathered friends, that's where the high frequency consonants of speech reside. So our ears are most sensitive to these high frequency sounds. And that's because of the resonance of your outer ear and the resonance of your middle ear that you studied in 120 anatomy. Let's look at the next slide. A whole bunch of investigators found similar stuff. A whole bunch of people, look at all these guys. And they all found these, this curve, all these, this, this general bend. And they're called the minimal audible pressure at the eardrum as determined by various experiences or experimenters. And what's the purpose here? They're trying to find the softest level it took to just barely hear all the tones. So I'll stop sharing here. Remember what we described in Unit 2 in the decibel? And we said, what's 0 dB SPL? That's the softest it took for a normal hearing human to hear a 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. Remember that? So, okay, you mark that one down, we'll call that zero. That's 0 0.0002 dynes per centimeter squared, and we're going to call that pressure zero dB sound pressure level. Cool. Okay, we talked about that. What happens if you play the same game with 2,000 hertz? What's the softest it took to hear a 2,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker? with two ears. What's the softest it took to hear a 4,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears? And what's the softest it took to hear an 8,000? And then a 500 hertz, and then a 250, and then a 125. And you're going to end up with a curve. And the curves are going to be exactly like we showed you on these experimenter slide. They're going to be, you're going to have a curve. So all these experimenters found that our ears are more sensitive at some frequencies than at other frequencies. So you remember this, a bit of wee, a wee bit of review here. Recall this from Unit 2. 
okay? The softest it took to hear a 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. That softest pressure was 0 0.0002 dynes per centimeter squared, and we call that zero decibel sound pressure level. And then every time you increase the pressure by a factor of 10, you went up 20 dB and all that blah, 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 blah. And we all covered the difference between dB and dBSPL. We said one's an absolute and one's a relative value, but you got to know where the ground is because otherwise you can't tell if an apartment is twice as tall as a house. So all these values here are absolute dB values. They're all referenced to this corner here. Okay. Now, a relative value we said in our notes in unit two is just simply dB. I can add dB and dBSPL together no problem, but I can't add two dBSPLs together like that. So 90 dBSPL plus 90 dBSPL does not repeat not equal 180, okay? If it's two identical things, it's 96. If it's two different things, it's 93. Cool. But if you're saying dBSPL plus dB, then you can add like one plus two is three. Just a bit of review, all I'm doing is describing stuff we did in Unit 2 so that I can finish this Zoom session with a, descri a short description of MAF and MAP. So if you have a relative dB, think about time. 4 p.m. 4 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. Central time. Those are absolute time values. Okay, you can't add 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. It doesn't make any sense. Can't add two absolutes together. But I can add two hours. That's a relative time value. I can add two hours to 4 p.m. and now it's 6 p.m. I can add two hours to 6 p.m. Now it's 8 p.m. So now I am adding like one plus two is three. And it's what we do in hearing aids too. Input to a hearing aid is dBSPL. What the hearing aid adds is gain, dB. And the sum total is dBSPL that hits your eardrum. So input plus gain is output. Input dBSPL plus gain dB equals the sum total output dBSPL. All review. Good. Now we go to MAF and MAP. So read the slides carefully here because this is a verbal description of what I just talked about. And this slide is giving that example of time. Here's minimal audible field. Very important slide, so important that I'm going to make it even larger. Okay, MAF. Read what it says in white. It's the softest level required to just barely hear all the frequencies at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears, not just a thousand. It's all the different frequencies. So now look at 1000. You'll see a little white line going up and look at here. That's what we called zero dBSPL. No news there. It's all the same. But look at 500. I've got to make it more intense for a listener to hear a 500 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. Okay. And 250, I've got to make it more. And look at 125, I've got to make it 40. 125 has to be 40 friggin' decibels in order to be just barely audible. Now, look at 2,000. Look very carefully at two. It's even less than zero. And look at three and four. They're like at minus 10. They're softer yet. So zero dBSPL does not mean no sound. Zero dBSPL, remember, it's the softest it takes to hear a 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears. But to hear a 2,000 hertz tone or a 4,000 hertz tone, it's going to be less than zero dBSPL. Na, 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 na. Okay? That's what I'm trying to talk about here. And now let's look at MAP. Because we don't do hearing tests with two ears in front of a speaker. We do hearing tests with one ear under a headphone, one ear at a time. So that's called minimal audible pressure, not minimal audible field. Field means in a sound field, pressure, now we're talking headphone. 
And notice the white curve is a little bit above the yellow curve. That means that two ears are slightly better than one because minimal audible pressure is this. Look what it says in white. The softest level required to just barely hear all the different frequencies with one ear under a headphone. With one ear under a headphone. And notice it too is curved just like this, this line is and just like these are and just like this was. They're all curved. So here's where we talk about DBHL. Now, how now, brown cow? Look very carefully. See that top MAP? Notice that curve? That curve, M-A-P, I'm going to look at you now, is I-S, underline, bold-faced, capital letters, that curve is 0 dB H L. So the flat line that you will see on an audiogram, at the top of an audiogram, and if I draw a picture quickly of an audiogram, you will see 0 here and 120 here. And if you're looking at that zero line, okay, that zero line right here, that is minimal audible pressure. That's why people come in every year to calibrate your audiometer. It's the law. It's just like you getting new license plates on your car. It's like you're required to, to renew your driver's license. Okay, it's the law. And you have to make sure that 0 dB HL, audio hearing level, that's what HL stands for, on your audiogram, you have to be absolutely positive that that indeed actually represents this white curve. So that 0 dB HL on a hearing test, on an audiogram, is actually, 125 is actually 40 40 dB SPL. And 250 is actually about 25. And 500 is actually about 10. And 1,000 is about 5. And 2,000 is about 3. And look at the little bump. Do you ever wonder why you have is the little bump here? There is a bump on MAF. And the reason you have a bump on MAF is because it's the softest required to hear with one ear under a headphone, and you just plugged up the ear with a headphone. And when you plug up an ear with a headphone, you just backed your truck over the open, unaided ear canal resonance. The resonance that you studied in 120. Physiology of the outer ear. That, that increase between 1500 and 4000 hertz with its peak at 2700 hertz. The ear canal as a quarter wave resonator, open at one end, closed at the other, right? Resonates with sound waves four times the length of the tube. Well, you just plugged up that tube on both ends now. You plugged it up with a headphone. Whether you used a circumoral headphone or an insert headphone, you plugged it up. And that's why MAP has a little bump over here. Because that gift that you were given by that outer ear canal resonance has been robbed. It's been taken back. So the point I'm trying to drive home here is that you now have two dB references. One's dB SPL that you studied in acoustics, and now we're moving to psychoacoustics. Now you have a second one, and that's dB HL, hearing level. Because now you're not just measuring the, the physics of sound. No, you're measuring how do humans hear sound. And humans, because of our ear canal shape and the resonances of our middle ear, humans hear some frequencies better than other frequencies. And humans, if you've, you're setting the person at one meter distance from a speaker, you're going to get a curve, minimal audible field. 
because of the resonances of our outer and middle ears. You know, we hear some frequencies more better than other ones. And then when we plug up the ear with a headphone, and we want to find out how does one ear hear under a headphone, all the different frequencies, we still have uneven hearing sensitivity across the frequencies. Can't do anything about that, but we want to call that white curve zero. And that's what we do in dBHL. So grab a hold of an audiogram, a hearing test. And I wonder if I had the wisdom to, to put that in here. I wonder if I did. Yeah, here it is. Perfect. There's an audiogram. Look at the frequencies tested. Seven octave frequencies. Look at zero. Zero dB HL. So make yourselves... Knock yourself on the forehead, do whatever you want to do, but that flat line of zero is MAP. Okay, MAP is built into your audiometer, built into the equipment that's meant to test hearing. So zero dBHL on an audiogram at 125. Okay, look at how it says zero there. In all actuality, it's about 40. Okay, these, these are built into your audiometer. And it's called calibration, your audiome audiometric calibration. It has to be done every year. It's the law. You have to pay somebody to come in from a, from a company that calibrates audiometers, and they make sure that zero dB HL, okay, really represents this white curve here. All right, I will stop, or let's say I'll stop sharing that, okay, and we'll start sharing something else. Let's go to, get out of here, and look at our writing at the bottom of the page, so we're done. Intensity affects thresholds, but so does frequency. Now here I'm just reading this with you. Minimal audible field. Thresholds with subject facing a so sound source like a speaker, listening with two ears in a soundproof room. Very different numbers across the frequency. Shows our best hearing is between 1,000 to 4,000 hertz. Don't worry about the exact numbers. I don't even know what they are. Just know that very different SPLs are required across the frequencies. What you're doing here is you're playing the same game as you did with the speaker and the 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears. You're playing that very same game, only you're doing it with all the different frequencies and not just 1000 hertz. And what that experiment will show you is that we have very uneven hearing across the frequencies. And then you'll recall even from unit two, remember dBA intensity and the decibels? The curve is due to the resonances of the ears. So over here, when I showed you this guy, I think, yeah, remember this from unit two? dBA, look at they're taking that curve upside down, A, with a sound level meter, and they're decreasing its sensitivity to the really soft sounds because we don't hear the really soft sounds, the low frequencies as well. So every time you saw that word dBA, that means sound level meter, measuring intensity of sound at a, at a factory, but that's building in minimal audible field and minimal audible pressure. It's building that in, saying, hey man, the low frequencies over here where I'm circling, we don't hear those very well anyway. So it's not fair to say that 85 dB SPL at 20 or 50 hertz is dangerous, because it isn't that dangerous to us. We can't hear that very well. So that's why we have a weighting dBA when it comes to sound level meters, and it's all because of these guys and this guy. Okay, the final thing to take home here, read with me now, minimal audible pressure. That's with one ear, subject is listening to all the different tones once again, but this time with one ear under a headphone. Depending on the frequencies, two ears give about 5 dB better hearing than one ear. Look at these two lines again. Look at the decibel distance. Notice how the white line is about 5 dB above the yellow line. 
That means two ears are about 5 dB better than one. Hmm. And that should be kind of telling you something. Look at somebody who's deaf in one ear. Say I'm deaf in this ear. Does that mean I have a 50% hearing loss? Hell no. Not at all. <laughs> okay, if I play it, if I can't hear, if I have a 50 decibel hearing loss here and a 50 decibel hearing loss here, if you played me the tone binaurally, my threshold would, would improve to 45. If my hearing level was 40 here and 40 here, binaural stimulation, 35. Okay, five, two ears are about 5 dB better than one ear. What does a person with one ear have a problem with? Doesn't have a big hearing loss. They've got about a 5% hearing loss. That's all. The main problem with a one-eared person is he or she can't tell the direction of sound. They're screwed. Just like with one eye, you have no depth perception. You think you do, but that's just your brain fooling you. one eye people, people blind in one eye, have no depth perception. You need two eyes to see depth. You need two ears to hear direction. And we'll cover that more next week. I think we've done enough this week. What we've done is threshold, method of limits, bias, noise, false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives. We talked about herb, on one end of the spectrum and Mrs. McGillicuddy on the other end of the spectrum. And then we broke into minimal audible field and minimal audible pressure and how those relate to 0 dB HL on an audiogram. We'll pick up on this next week. I'll be reviewing some of this and then we'll charge forward in that particular unit. So next week we'll still stay in unit four. <sighs> All right. How's it going, Karen? Pretty good? Good, yeah. All right, good stuff. I'll sign off here. I'll stop recording, and um, I'll go in, uh, take an hour break, and I'll come back and do some uh, anatomy. I'm not sure if you'll be there, but who will be there? Who knows? But uh, we'll see you then. Okay. All right, bye. Thanks.